Hello. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening, everyone, wherever you are joining from the world. Welcome to the Diversity, Equality, and Inclusion Month. This is the focus by the Global Alliance uh, for Public Relations and Communication for the month of June. And we have lined together very exciting webinars that will focus on the topic of diversity, equality, and inclusion. So I would like to welcome you. My name is Peter Mutie. I'm talking to you from Nairobi, Kenya. And I also serve in the Global Alliance Board. To begin with, would like to play a small video to introduce us to the theme of diversity, equality, and inclusion. Then we will get to the webinar. The Global Alliance for Public Relations and Communication Management, GA, is the confederation of the world's major PR and communication management associations and institutions, representing over 360,000 practitioners and academics around the world. This month, GA is celebrating Diversity, Equality and Inclusion, DEI. In honor of this initiative, we are hosting a series of three insightful webinars that aim to foster best practices and innovative strategies within the realms of DEI. Join us in celebrating our diversity. Hi, I'm Justin Green, and I'd like to welcome each and every one of you right around the world in joining us for Diversity, Equality and Inclusion Month, running throughout the month of June. So wherever you are in the world, please join us online free of charge for the many events that will be taking place during the month of June. So hopefully we'll see you then. Take care. Regards from North America. My name is Gladys Diaz and as Global Alliance board member, I would like to invite you to celebrate June, Diversity, Equality and Inclusion Month. Take advantage of the educational content and the webinars that we have to offer. Global Alliance is an inclusive institution and we are here for you. Hi, my name is Stephen Shepson Smith and I'm a board director of the Global Alliance. I'm here representing Europe and the Chartered Institute of Public Relations. The CIPR is the only PR membership organization in the world to hold the national equality standard. So the equity, diversity and inclusion are incredibly important to us. That's why I'm really excited about June at the Global Alliance, which is Diversity, Equality and Inclusion Month. We've got some brilliant webinars planned for later in the month, so please check out the Global Alliance website, and I hope to join you on some of those webinars uh, and see you on some of those webinars later in the month. Uh, thanks very much. I am Wale Adam Alekun of Elizade University, Nigeria. We at the Global Alliance African Regional Council only support the diversity, equality, and inclusion program of the uh, council. Uh, the program aims to actually take public relations out there to the public such that nobody is left behind. And so we believe the aims and the objectives of the various programs of the Global Alliance, especially the DEI, is worthy of attention is worthy of your promotion and we believe that this program is going to go places and indeed make sure that public relation becomes a household name in terms of its utility, in terms of its purpose and then of course the objectives for which the various programs that have been outlined will serve to humanity and the generality of our publics. Thank you. Hi friends and colleagues, Jenny Muir coming to you from Sydney, Australia. I'm a Global Alliance board member for the Asia Pacific region. I'd like to invite you to get involved and register with this month's program of work, which is all free for members. Um, it is focused on diversity, equality and inclusion, really important topics for our profession at the moment. Please take a look at the Global Alliance uh, website and register and get involved. Thank you. Hello, I'm Jude William Enilo, the Pro Vice Chancellor of the University of Liberal Arts, Bangladesh. 
I'm a Global Alliance Board of Director representing South Asia and the Middle East, and also an Academic and Research Council member. At Global Alliance, we have designated June as Diversity, Equality, and Inclusion Month. There are very interesting webinars lined up for everyone. First, on digital inclusion on June 20. Second, on best practices in diversity, equality, and inclusion on June 25. And third, on public relations and communication professionals, legislative inclusion on June 27. Please attend these webinars and the other activities of Global Alliance. Okay, thank you very much. That, that is the video. Um, introducing what Global Alliance is doing this month. And it was our precursor for the global webinar today. Why did we choose digital inclusion? Because connecting online has become an essential tool for us today. In fact, if you excluded digital connection, we will come to some kind of a standstill. And therefore, it is very important that as a PR professionals, we, we, we define the place of digital inclusion in our profession. And today, we are honored to have two distinguished global experts who will give us their thoughts on digital inclusion. Um, and then we will allow interaction session. The webinar will take us exactly one hour and we should have by then transacted the topic of uh, digital inclusion. To start with, we have Dr. Juan Nurudin, who is the Director of Transnational Education Department from the University Technology Mara. I believe it is the University of Technology in Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur. And after our presentation, we will again welcome Shreya uh, Krishnan, Managing Director of Anitab.org, India. So we start with uh, Dr. Wan Rodin. Welcome. Please take us through your presentation on this uh, topic of digital inclusion. All right. Thank you, Peter uh, and everyone. And thank you, Global Alliance, for having me. And uh, Matthias, hi. Uh, Shreya, hi. I think it's it's interesting that we're talking about digital inclusion, and I think this is actually a, a good example that we are able to do this, you know, in different parts of the world. So, um, let me share my screen. It's just going to be like a very short, um, uh, presentation. Um, just uh, you know, an introduction of uh, what digital inclusion is all about, and a little bit, uh, information on where Malaysia is going towards. Yeah. So can everyone see my screen? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. If I use presenter's view, does it make it smaller or can you see the notes or it's we can big? see we can see the notes in this one. <laughs> Okay. Actually, we only see the next slide, but so you can see the next slide. Yes. Ah, okay. All right. Before and was there. Might as well. I think I'm just gonna go with. Uh, wait. Let me just end it, and I'm going to um use this. Hang on. Okay. Yeah. Let's 
that big enough or because I think I need to... It's good enough. Yeah, it's good enough. All right, cool. So when we talk about digital inclusion, um, we're talking about ensuring all individuals and communities, regardless of their socioeconomic status, geographic location, age, and ability, or other factors, uh, to actually have access to and effectively use digital technology and internet. So the idea of digital inclusion in this sense is actually access. I think I'm just going to give you, I think, on my third slide of uh, the three things that I feel it is important when we talk about digital inclusion. So access to technology, digital literacy, affordability, and the creation of inclusive digital content and services. I think this is actually the key things and what, uh, when I talk about Malaysia, um, the, um, the country is actually working towards that. Um, when we talk about... Um, When we talk about Malaysian uh, digital transformation, we, we are looking at uh, Malaysia is actually in the adoption stage. And I think it's quite, um, they are actually um, currently uh, at par with some of the developed nations, um, such as uh, Canada, New Zealand. This is actually a report by our um, a National Bank of Malaysia, Bank Negara. And um, there are three things that, that the uh, feels it is important uh, when you're looking at digital transformation. It's actually having a fast and accessible uh, network. So um, uh, fast and affordable network. So that is actually one of the things that, one of the criteria that is actually important. And uh, secondly, is actually developing uh, human talents for um, uh, digital for digital uh, transformation. So to be able to actually train um, some um, human uh, talents uh, to actually be able to uh, execute and um, proceed or actually, um, um, how do you say, uh, move forward with work with the national agenda. And the third one is actually making sure that all the industries uh, would have um, the ability to actually use that kind of uh, digital transformation that the, the nations has provided. So the, the idea is actually Malaysia is actually going towards inclusive, responsible and sustainable development for an advancement in digital infrastructure. As you can see nowadays, uh, in our Ministry of Communication, they are uh, announcing uh, some uh, packages, affordable packages for different different uh, um, groups of people, different uh, age groups, um, you know, so that uh, it is affordable and, and uh, people can actually uh, use it. And the component of digital inclusion, I have uh I'm focusing on AEE. So the A is access. Access is still very important. Um, during the pandemic, I think we have realized that uh there are some um, places, you know, even in the cities that are uh do not have access to digital technologies, do not have access to network. Um, and it is very, very important uh for Malaysia especially to move forward and to make sure that accessibility is actually there. Because in order for us to include or to be inclusive when it comes to uh, digital um, activities, you know, you have to actually make sure that people have access to it. So access to digital technologies is actually, is actually very important. So that's my, my A. Uh, and also digital content and services accessibility as well. Um, you need to have that. And secondly is the E, so the education. I think this is very important, especially when we're dealing with different types of generations nowadays. So we are dealing with um, um, the Generation Z. Uh, that's actually my um, focus on research. So they are actually, um, this is something that they are born with. This is something that they need. So the four E's of Generation Z or Gen Z is they are electronically engaged and they are educated and they are empowered and they are entrepreneurial. So electronically engaged. So in order for us to make sure that 
the Gen Z thrive, you have to make sure that, you know, they are educated in using media and digital, and also they have the skills to do it. So media literacy, when accessibility is, is everywhere, when everybody is using um, digital devices, you need to make sure that the uh, literacy uh, are there. You need to actually be able to train them on how to use the media, uh, you know, and that comes to my third, uh, um, e, my second E, my third um, category, which is ethics. That is actually very, very important because we need to be able to um, have, I think ethics needs to be uh, taught because uh, when you have a very, um, when, when it is part and parcel of your um your day is actually to be online and to use social media. Um, sometimes um, the foundations of how to use it, the respect, the kindness is not there. So ethics, uh, ethical guidelines, it is needed. We cannot govern the internet or the social media or the digital uh, platforms, but I mean, it's difficult to govern you know, fully, but ethics can be taught um, and also um, uh, people like Gen Z, Gen Alpha, they can actually be trained in terms of using uh, digital services um, ethically. Okay, so AEE, access, education, which is focusing on media and digital literacy uh, and skills and also ethics. And the importance of, oh, again, I wanted to, talk a little bit, I mean, go back to access. Access, because I think the Malaysian government also is working on the access towards uh, people with disability. How do you get people with disability access to ICT? Uh, so that, that is actually a move forward uh, to actually make sure that, you know, all sorts of uh, groups of people uh, have access to ICT. So importance of digital inclusion is, uh, first, it improves um, education and lifelong learning because um, this is actually very important because we're moving towards a hybrid way of uh, consuming education. Uh, we are also having short courses focusing on platforms or modes such as, um, um, uh, how do you say, uh, oh, I just can't remember that word. Um, where we do training nowadays, it comes in short uh packages um, um and a lot of organizations and edu education institutions are actually looking at uh digital platforms to actually train and educate people and uh with ai and augmented reality is also part of uh the mode that they use um so it can improve education and lifelong learning uh especially when you have when you promote digital inclusion. And another thing is that um, it promotes um, civic engagement. So when we talk about civic engagement, we're talking about an informed citizen needs to be able to actually engage with the government in session. They need to be able to do voting and so on. And nowadays, um, I think um, there's a lot of digitization of the voting process that, that is uh, needed. I mean, for all uh, citizens to actually be able to uh, to do it or have access to it. And then um, the participation, such as voting, advocacy, engaging with government officials is also very important. So it promotes civic engagement. Um, another thing, it promotes equality and reduces the digital divide. Um, equality, um, because everybody needs to have the same kind of access in order to participate um, in the same platform. So um, digital inclusion help bridge gap between those who have access to digital technologies and those who do not, uh, reducing inequalities in access to information resources. Um, and also when we talk about um, e um, the equality uh, and opportunities to participate in digital, also in digital economy, access and educational resources, uh, and it can also benefit in terms of digital uh, services. I think that's it. Yes, 
So that's actually a little bit of introduction of what digital inclusion is all about. So uh, I look forward to the questions uh, during the panel sessions. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Wan Nurdin, for those very exciting insights from Malaysia. Um, we will now move to Shreyan Krishna, Managing Director of Antab.org in India. Welcome, Shreya. Thank you so much, Peter, and thank you for the insights. Uh, Wan, it's been an interesting uh, ride, especially when we look at the digital landscape of the way the world is changing and how inclusion is becoming so uh, contextual and relevant to the kind of world that we want to create, whether it's ESG, whether it's diversity, equity, inclusion, whether it's accessibility, all of these pieces sort of come together. And for digital access and digital inclusion, it's important for us to recognize the fact that the world is as diverse as it comes. And basically to understand that we need to be able to build accessibility so that everybody can access the information and communication technologies that are available to all. Uh, so not only is it about affordability, it's also about who can access it. What do differently abled communities need? What do the LGBTQIA communities need? So the whole idea of foundational access and equitable access to all of these spaces that you would see, whether it's education, healthcare, finance, employment, environment, landscape, all of it, and access to that societally is a, is a very important aspect of digital inclusion. When you look at some of the key components or tenets of creating inclusive technology, what does that mean? How do you create this? Now, this has been seen as an example in different countries, and we've come to some examples. One is, of course, economic access, making it affordable. Two is skill and training. You need to be able to access technology. And as long as you have not worked with it as you're younger, you're not digitally native, which means you need to be given the kind of skills and competencies and training to get you on board to the platforms. And to make sure that it's disability friendly, to understand different kinds of disabilities and how do you bring that on the spectrum. To understand digital literacy and what does digital literacy mean, which means access to different kinds of platforms, ability to use those platforms, content that's relevant, that's also regional, because if you were to look at India with a massive diaspora, multiple regional languages, for us to be able to reach accessibility, it also involves relevant content that's specific to geographic needs, demographic needs. Support and infrastructure, you need to also have the infrastructure for digital inclusion. You need to have the ability to reach those smaller towns and cities. And when you look at India, we have the urban India, we have the rural India, and the whole idea of being able to reach those. And that has been something that India has managed to do well. Um, sometimes we joke saying a lot of Indians don't have access to clean toilets, but they all have access to smartphones. So, you know, the spread of the digitization that we see is really widespread. And what does that mean then? When you look at the digital divide, there is a massive digital divide for people being able to use digital platforms, digital hardware. So there is a significant gap, the internet and access to the internet and digital technologies versus those who don't have that access. And, and it's this is what you would see, right? When learning has become online, when uh, schools went into online mode, a lot of people who couldn't afford it didn't have access to education for the years that India shut down for COVID. So that has also been one of those economic lines that divides access to uh, people who don't have the ability to get uh, into the technologies that are available. So billions of people in the world are left out of participation. And because of that, there is a digital divide. So understanding that. Now, how do we see these barriers to inclusion? There are multiple things that contribute to the digital landscape and the divide that there is. There are humanitarian issues. There are digital inclusion issues. We have not entirely overcome them. So it's basically multiple barriers which are around affordability, which is a high cost of devices, of internet services, all of those are prohibitive to underprivileged communities. When you look at literacy, without the skills, you can't access it. So there's no benefit. Although you may know how to watch a YouTube video if you don't know how to order online. Or There are various aspects and utilization aspects around digitization. If you can't access that, you're not able to you know, get the full benefit of it. And of course, infrastructure, which I already spoke about, digital infrastructure for us to be able to reach this to communities that really need to get it through. What do we need as strategies for change? We need policy interventions. We need governments to involve. We need broadband. We need the corporations to get involved. We need public-private 
you know, collaborations to ensure that this access is taken to a wider segment of the population. We need a lot of private sector initiatives, which are businesses which are investing in ensuring the digital divide is met because there is purchasing power, because there is magic in the volume of numbers. If they could access the internet, what could potentially happen? And of course, community solutions like local organizations, not for profits, mm -hmm. understanding community needs, building language. One of the things that we do at anitab.org is we have mm -hmm. STEM education for young girl children. Um, to give you a statistic, it's something called the Scully effect. It is known that about 90% of women who watched mm -hmm. a program called the X-Files back in the day would actually choose STEM roles, which is science, technology, engineering, math versus girls who didn't. So it's also representation. It's also media. It's also how we communicate. Inclusion requires action across different segments. It's what you see and people resonating with what you see. It's a, my CEO calls it the meritocracy. As a mirror, if you can see yourself do something, somebody like you doing it is when you will be able to do that. So that's also a part of inclusion. And that's also a part of the conversations we need to have around inclusion. Successful mm -hmm. stories, there are multiple. I hear I've quoted South Korea, which basically had government policies, which was near universal internet access, focusing on high speed connections. Great example. Everyone on campaign in the USA, which was basically around communities to ensure that residents, everyone could use the internet, focusing on affordable home internet services. But I will talk about a personal Indian story, which is the digitization of payments. Overnight, when demonetization happened, India switched over into Paytm, into various pay payment platforms, Google Pay, etc., for us to be across the country, make payments online. And this includes street side vendors who have little cards who also have, you know, QR codes that you can scan and pay. And that's one of one of the biggest success stories of digital inclusion that uh, we've managed to see. And path forward for policymakers, basically to look at enacting and enforcing regulations that supports equitable access to technology, for businesses to continue to innovate, to consider affordability, accessibility, and the spectrum of what we need to look at, for communities to create opportunities for evangelizing and education around uh, digital inclusion, why it's important, why it's relevant, for individuals to advocate and participate in these community efforts that happen. So basically to come together to ensure that the benefits of digital technology are really and truly accessible to all. So that's where I'll stop, Peter, and I'll hand it back to you. Wow, thank you very much. Um, again, very insightful thoughts and um, inputs on digital inclusion. But now we want to get to where the rubber meets the ground. And that is the business we are in, which is public relations. And I would like again to pose this question to, to you, both of you. I know we have touched on it, but for emphasis, um, and we start with the, Dr. Wan Nordin. How can PR and communication professionals harness benefits? presented today by the digital space, because that space has expanded expo exponentially. And indeed, there is um, a lot of benefit that in my view, and, and of course from uh, the practitioners, we need to take up. Just give us your thoughts on how you think we need to move forward harnessing these benefits as public relations professionals. Unmute, unmute, please. Oh, yeah, yeah, I am. <laughs> okay, when we talk about public relations practitioners, how we can harness this digital inclusion, the benefits of digital inclusion is that we can access more, more people um, in terms of events, in terms of, you know, uh, all the activities, PR activities uh, that we have. Um, let's, for example, um, I remember when I was with Motorola, um, we, it was many, many years ago, uh, there was a big flood in Penang and we need to reach all our employees, um, you know, because they have uh, shift works. So uh, we use radio, we use TV, but nowadays with, uh, you know, uh, digital advancement, you can use apps, you can use social media, you can use, because everybody has a mobile phone. Uh, so your, your access to different groups of publics are bigger. And I think it's... Um, 
the, the time to get them is shorter and it's also cost efficient because most of the time it is relatively low. Um, and I think that is uh, such a, um, how do you say, a development for public relations practitioners because in order to be able to actually access specific publics as well, uh, you have, you know, different social media, um, uh, you can actually target, you know, um, this is just a simple example, you know, uh, somebody lost their cat, but they can actually, you know, go to the Facebook and actually, you know, key in the particular area where they lost their cat and actually, you know, and put the poster of, of lost cat poster to actually target that particular uh, group or that particular area. And you can actually use that as a PR practitioner and also with uh, educators like me, um, I want to be able to, to how do you say, uh, talk in my students' language. So I teach a lot of Gen Z and Gen Alpha, and I have a Gen Z and Gen Alpha at home as well. So sometimes it is, um, there's this digital divide between the two of us, but with digital inclusion, I am able to actually learn new things, new apps, um, and how to actually be able to communicate, you know, and there are there are platforms that are beyond um, uh, Twitter, beyond social media, which my Gen Alpha is frequenting. So I, I feel that you know I've never heard of that platform before. And then she and then she said that you know it is uh, actually a gathering of all um, uh, those people who actually likes to um, edit videos. So we have that app, so we can communicate. So they have that communication uh, element to the app. So. All these are, I think it's, it's tremendous um, resources and benefits that we can actually harness with. Um, and I think at the very beginning, when um, social media was introduced, I think PR practitioners was actually reluctant to get on board because they're saying that, you know, we talk, we talk face to face. But now I think we need to be able to do that hybrid, hi do it, you know, hybridly. I mean, you can digitally communicate you can you know communicate online you can also do a face-to-face -face. but again you know being uh someone in my age i prefer the face-to-face -face, uh co communication but uh, again this is something that we can avoid and i think we should somehow embrace it because it's there chat gpt is there you know embrace it it's available if we don't use you can use it but i think you are you have that ethics embedded in you and you also have that experience embedded in you to know that you know it is not all there you need to actually use research and data to back up whatever it is that you you need to do in terms of your proposal in terms of the event crisis management issues management reputation management and so on <laughs> thank you very much um, um what should I? your thoughts as well on how we so, are going to do this. Yeah, so, so I think uh, there's a massive opportunity from a, a reach and accessibility perspective, especially when you look at reputation and goodwill building from a brand's perspective, right? As an individual, uh, there is so much that you can do, but as a brand, there's so much more reach. You can build so much more goodwill. You can build, find more avenues and pathways of being able to reach out. And it also becomes a great business pitch right, for you to be able to access communities that were not accessible before as a brand, for you to be able to start dialogues, for you to be able to build a market, uh, for you to communicate in their language, for you to have digital access, to be able to reach to those communities that you couldn't before. So understanding digital, um, you know, inclusion and going deeper into it, not only helps you from a PR and a reputation building perspective, but also from a very deep business perspective. It's about honing those you know, various communities that are so far untapped into tapping that market, into building that market, into creating equal, equitable change in those markets. And participatory change can come when you look at public policy coming together with the private, you know, innovation and private organizations doing what they're doing and then community outreach. And if you can combine all of them as an organization that's deeply invested in, in, in ensuring digital literacy or widening uh, you know, that entire spectrum of accessibility or deepening the reach that you have to the kind of communities that exist, 
it gives you that much more reach and it gives you that much more strength because now you're diversifying and now you're building true inclusion. You're able to innovate better, build better, reach better, access better. And that I think is a digital inclusion. We've lost, we've lost you. I think you've you've frozen a bit there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> is it fine? Yeah. No, I'm yeah, fine. Yeah. When did you lose me though? I, I was saying that's the, the end. It was the end. End. Yeah. yeah. I was saying that's the superpower of digital inclusion. Better reach, exactly. better accessibility. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Now, so every coin has got two sides. We've yeah. talked about the benefits or how we can use it for the benefit of our profession. Mm -hmm. What are the risks? Because I believe there are also risks. And we can start with you, Shreya. The risks include not involving voices that ideally should be brought into the fore. The risks also include being inaccessible to certain aspects of inclusion. If you're not investing in digital inclusion, but you're, can you all hear me? Am I, am I frozen or am I okay? Okay, so when you look at the risks, especially from a PR perspective, the risk includes letting people go, not bringing everybody to the table, you know, doing it only in pockets, making it skewed towards a certain business only agenda, because building reputation is about really investing at the grassroots level for change. But if you don't do that equitably, there is a risk that you leave out communities and populations that could potentially have built and developed your business better. There is also the risk of actually not doing justice to contextually geographic demographies. Like if you were to just regionalize it with just language, it doesn't help because there are so many different cultural nuances about how you would call like branding, you know, when you take examples of branding, Eon, the car never worked in Latin America because Eon in Spanish apparently means no movement or, or no go, right? So examples like that, names that you give, um, things that you bring on. Inclusion needs to start from understanding the psychographic and the demographic of the spaces that you're reaching. But with digital inclusion, there is a little bit of a fear, especially when you look at AI-based uh, learning. So much of AI is, has inherited human bias. And the fear of that is that human bias is going to continue to spill over into a lot of the activities that AI is going to take over and run. And there are many examples of that. That's another risk mm -hmm. to be able to really make AI inclusive and bias free so that it can drive better change in a form and manner that the biases don't translate there as well. So those are some of the primary top tier risks that I see. Thank you very and much. Those risks, yeah. And those risks will spill over into business as well. So it's as important for businesses to look at it from, from a business perspective as well. Thank you. Dr. Nordin? <laughs> when you say Dr. Nordin, is my dad. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Dr. Wang. <Wan. laughs> <laughs> because one Nordin, because uh, for us, it's one Nordin is the name of our dad. So my uh -huh. name is actually one Nordin, but it's okay. It's okay. All right, all right, all right. Okay, so risk, risk of digital inclusion. I feel that um, the more people have access to digital technologies, the more um, dilute, can I say diluted uh, one's culture is. There's a lot of new culture that's actually been um, uh, created or accepted online on, in terms of online community, the cancel culture, uh, but there's also this pros and cons. There's, there's a lot of uh, movement online uh, when you have that digital inclusion uh, that can support or advocate a cause, but there's also the opposite of it, you know, the negative side of it. Uh, people are becoming more direct because I don't know, maybe there's a, they think there's a, there's a, a can I say a barrier? A, between them and uh, the other person be just because they're online. So, um, and they are very direct and the, 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 the kindness part is not there. The respect part is also not there. I think in terms of culture wise, we are becoming, we are looking at like a, they said, they said like a one world culture kind of thing and everybody, everything is accepted online. And I think that's a risk, especially coming from uh, the Southeast Asian 
a nation that um, I think we need to be able to um, nurture our culture and include that in the conversation online. So digital inclusion, that will be some of the risks. And also some of the risks is that uh, when they are, everything is actually being operated uh, digitally, there's no, the security or the privacy part is also, it can become a risk because now with there's a lot of, you know, cases of scamming and, um, you know, digital, um, uh, how do you say, threats uh, in terms of company security and information being leaked out and so on and so forth. So I think um, there's a lot of it. But I feel that with ethics and media literacy, this can be curbed, uh, can be controlled. Um, and that is why I feel that it is very, very important. And, and Malaysia is moving towards that. And I think, as, you know, other you know, developed nations such as Singapore has, the, has a media literacy center that focuses on teaching their citizen on how and, you know, how to use this, the media, how to use digital media how to communicate online, you know, what are the things that you should be looking for, how to differentiate fake news, that's also another risk, uh, you know, fake information, how do you know whether that's the truth? Because there's so many things out there, but with us, uh, the migrants, because we are not the digital natives, so the migrants will be able to do it because we, we based it on research and we know what are the, the original sources or what are the the truthful sources, and we have now apps uh, by the media to actually determine whether the news is actually genuine or fake. So these are some of the things that I feel, you know, contribute to the risk of digital inclusion um, when everybody is actually on board. But I think the, the benefits with ethics and media literacy outweighs the risk. And I think a lot of government are looking towards policy uh, and also uh, laws to actually, guidelines to actually, you know, govern or manage uh, whatever we do um, digitally. All right. Thank you very much. Now, there, there are questions from the audience, and I will start with the first one from Collins. And this goes to Shreya. What skills or competencies do you believe are essential for PR practitioners to effectively navigate issues of digital inclusion and diversity? Firstly, I think it's a combination of IQ and EQ because you need both the technical skills, which is understanding how the digital, you know, um, entire ecosystem works, how technologies work. For a lot of us, it's something that we've already inherited. We've been used to using it sort of some some of the unlearning also of really imagining and putting ourselves in the shoes of digital natives to understand what that means, um, which is why I say EQ, because understanding diversity and understanding inclusion first is about understanding the fact that everybody is different, that one size does not fit all, that, you know, for us to be able to develop something that's collective, we need to have that heterogeneous collective. If the room is full of people who look the same and they're ideating or innovating, in all likelihood, we're leaving out a lot of the communities that are, don't look and feel the same way. So really to start making our teams look more diverse, to start bringing in different kinds of personalities, to understand that diversity is generational, to understand that diversity is neurodiversity, you know, to understand that it's often a spectrum of gender diversity, sexual orientation, disability. I'm bringing in the larger context of diversity and inclusion into digitization will diminish a lot of the gaps that we see currently. So skills and competencies, both an understanding of the tech space of it, and of course, of understanding various communities and how they work and really getting into that as we start building digital inclusion from both sides and really leveraging it. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, next question is to one, and this is it. Did you identify any ethical considerations that PR professionals should keep in mind when working towards digital inclusion in their campaigns? And how can PR practitioners measure the impact of their efforts towards promoting digital inclusion and closing digital divide? Two questions, one. Okay. <laughs> All right. So when we talk about digital inclusion and how, um, what, how did, okay, any ethical consideration. So ethical consideration, I think it applies um, 
not only digitally, um, when we are going to be uh, working in campaigns and to, the idea of digital inclusion has to be considered in a sense that um, I, I think it depends on the objective of the campaign. The objective of the campaign is actually to target you know, women, urban and rural areas. So you need to be able to have some sort of representation of that uh, publics or that uh, category or that group of women in the rural areas and if there's if let's say uh you know they they don't have access to it and i think you need because in malaysia we have um let's say there's this um research project that we're doing with the um the um the orang asli the orang asli is like the aboriginals of um malaysia so um we need to be able to um, identify or actually go to their head of uh, villages. The head of villages nowadays, even if let's say the 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 uh, the people uh, in the village do not have access to a mobile phone, but the head of villages they do have that. And now with uh, companies uh, through their CSR programs, they are actually uh, giving access to this group of people. So you have that they have that digital access. So ethical consideration is to be able to understand uh, the needs of, of the public that you are uh, researching about, the public that you are uh, campaigning with, you know. So the target of your campaign is, is such. So the idea is to consider, to consider uh, the ability for them to participate in your campaign. Um, and also, I think, to be able to speak the, the same language. And I think um, in ethics, it's actually, you know, um, a lot of these um, categories in ethics that talks about being honest, uh, being truthful, being professional. And I think kindness is needed in digital literacy because uh, people can be mean, people can be, uh, and, and that I think, you know, when um, Shreya was talking about um, uh, just now, when we talk about diversity and online, you know, there's a lot of cases whereby there's no kindness in the, in the communication that they, they do, especially, you know, towards people that they see is different from them. So digital inclusion, ethics, ethics should be, I think these are some of the um, values that we have to, uh, I think, include uh, when we talk about digital inclusion. And how can we measure the impact of our efforts towards promoting digital inclusion and closing the digital divide? How do we measure it? Um, nowadays, of course, you have all the digital measurement that you can do, you know, um, social sentiments. There's a lot of apps that you can actually do that. However, um, I still feel that with um, technology, you can actually get a more, a more richer data. Uh, you know, to see uh, how do they feel about, you know, with video uh, communication, uh, you can actually get raw data and you can actually analyze it as if you're interviewing them. Um, the sentiment analysis is actually very superficial for, for my sense. I mean, you, if you want to get the numbers, of course, they have, um, you can actually test out, uh, you know, whether whatever it is that you posted online, whether it is negative, positive, or whether they are angry or sad or whatever in terms of that news. But I think with um, the, uh, in order for you to measure the impact of your efforts, it's actually, uh, you can actually um, use the technology to actually get access to them without having them there in front of you. And closing the digital divide, I feel that PR practitioners can actually do more research in terms of uh, you know, talking about um, where that they can help in terms of promoting the policies, in terms of digital inclusion, um, and giving access not only to the different different communities, but uh, people with disabilities, because these are the people that are actually being left out uh, when new policies are actually being introduced, because a lot of governments are focusing now on uh, giving affordable, uh, how do you say, uh, affordable uh, telecommunication network uh, for the citizens but uh, there are some uh, generation like the aging community uh, uh, you know communities you know those uh, baby boomers who doesn't want to who doesn't know how to use a mobile phone who doesn't know how to you know um, 
uh, to use an app for that, you know. So they, they need to be like some sort of like a training session or reach um, a, a campaign to actually, uh, you know, encourage them to actually use this so that they will be included as well. Uh, you know, um, I remember again, you know, uh, when we first uh, thought it is back in my motor like this. We thought how the we thought the the group leader in a factory how to use the mouse because at, at the point of time they don't even know how to use computer. But now even you know my father is actually a very uh, how do you say avid fan of digital technology. So he has a smartphone. My mom is not so much. So he doesn't she doesn't want to use it. She wants to talk to us uh, with the phone, but she doesn't know. You know she. These are the different different generations that we have to target in order to actually close the digital divide, I feel. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, there's another question from Colin Skenoti, and I request uh, both of you to give your thoughts on it, because it's a question that is touching on a contemporary issue. Environment, social, and governance, ESG is becoming one of the drivers in shaping the brand reputation of organizations. And diversity, inclusion, and equality is a key metric of ESG. How best can VR practice integrate diversity, equality, and inclusion into their operations in relation to ESG? We can start with the Shreya. So ESG is, um, I mean, ideally we should have started with ESG when corporations began, but the industrial revolution didn't allow for a lot of thinking on what could the long-term impacts of actions be. And there is this beautiful Ban Ki-moon quote, which says all of the issues we deal with today, whether it's climate change, whether it's women's issues, whether it's wars, whether it's genocide, all of the problems are all connected. And they all intersect with each other, which means if you start finding solutions to one, and ESG is a great example of that, ESG and DEI are not separate. Until you have diversity, inclusion, and equity brought in, the impact on ESG you will see when you bring that in is a lot faster, which means more diverse groups can bring about more change in context of climate in terms of you know, the positive spin towards development. How do you understand different nuances around it? So these are practices that need to be imbibed, not just for PR, but across the business. Everybody should be a diversity champion. Everybody should be an inclusion champion. And the reason there's so much resistance to it is the political landscape does not allow for that. Um, you know, if you look at the world fundamentally where it's going, DEI has suddenly become a bad word. Um, similarly, ESG is being brought in, but it's almost like tokenism. You know, about being, there are brands that are great examples that do phenomenal work in the environment space. Um, but these are smaller brands. The large, um, you know, mandates that are run are often run because it's become now a buzzword. So what is the intention? What we forget is there is financial implications. The more you bring in ESG and the more you bring in diversity and inclusion, there's more money on the table, right? There is a, research that was done by this professor in uh, in Oxford and she basically compared heterogeneous groups and homogeneous groups so she brought in a homogeneous group to do the same task she brought in a heterogeneous group to do the same task and she observed them now the heterogeneous more diverse groups had a way better response ratio they performed better as a team they had more healthier dealing of conflict all of that the homogeneous teams were not so great but when she measured the confidence and the performance the homogeneous groups assumed their confidence rates were 60% higher than that of the heterogeneous groups who thought they weren't doing a great job, right? So that is fundamentally bringing this conversation back into looking at ESG and saying all of these needs to have representation from people of different communities, different kinds of people, different races, different genders, different orientations, because only when you bring in that skill set of diversity and inclusion into a conversation, when you bring in the thought of climate change, impact on climate, impact on governance, how we, in terms of our ethical practices, and Van spoke about it, unless you bring in that as a very intentional measure, it is tokenism. So as practitioners, for us to really understand why and to tell businesses, listen, there is business profit benefit 
to being able to do this with intentionality, and it's not just a tick, tick in the box, is a role that we can play as advocates of this practice. So that I think is a, is a way for us to start with. Thank you very much. Well, all right. Um, when we talk about ESG, I think like like I agree with Shreya. Some are taking it as you know, uh, just jumping on the bandwagon. It's not something that it should be done, you know, wholeheartedly or or fully. Uh, but again, there are companies who who are actually doing it, and I think um there was this uh it's a tire company i can't remember what the name of it a tire company uh automated its um process to include women in the production line because you know uh before it was just men uh and i think it's too heavy for the women to actually you know change the tires or you know some of the parts of the tires i can't remember what was the, the name of the brand but they automate it to, in, to, to include women in the workforce, to increase the percentage of women in the workforce. And I think it's, it's interesting when they do that. And also nowadays, you can see that a lot of annual reports uh, will, uh, will show you or explain to you their you know, no. ESG efforts, isn't it? And um, companies, like you said, everything... Um, Nowadays, they are, some of them are very, very serious. So they link their carbon footprints to the bonuses of their top management. So if, let's say, you do not reach the KPI of you know reducing your carbon, carbon footprint, you won't get the bonus. So the top management yeah. are into that. So financial uh, implication uh, to ensure that the companies are moving towards the ESG goals, I think that is actually really, really good. And I think a lot of companies are doing that uh, nowadays. Um, and uh, I think, um, and again, with, you know, uh, Gen Z, Gen Alpha, the millennials are, are also, you can see there's a, a rise of these um, uh, key online leaders or social media influencers. We're talking about environmentalists, you know, as young as, you know, they're in their teens, talking about environment. Uh, Greta Thunberg, who's very passionate about, you know, saving this world and saying that, you know, um, we, you know, the the baby boomers, the Gen Z, you know, the Gen X and Gen Y, you are destroying our world. You know, when you are long gone, we are here. So we need to somehow do this for us. So they are doing that, and the rise of environmentalists uh, among the Gen Z and the, the the Gen Alpha is actually you know huge compared to you know we were be before. And also, you know, there's a lot of issues in this world, a lot of conflicts in this world that is actually the advocacy efforts come uh, really strongly from this, this younger generation. And I think uh, we are moving towards, uh, you know, the, the, the right way. We're moving towards improving ourselves in terms of making ourselves accountable for ESG. And I think a lot of companies are moving towards that, you know, as compared to before this, like, you know, it's just a token. It's just that, you know, it's a buzzword that, you know, people are doing it. So I will just put that so that, you know, my brand is at par with everybody else. So I guess, you know, we are moving towards that. But it is, uh, we, we can see some good examples, but there should be more. Thank you very much. We are actually running short of time. And oh, uh, <laughs> we're just having fun. <laughs> in only one minute. <laughs> there's there's, there's um, a participant by the name Catherine. In one minute, Shreya, she's asking, how should we deal with the disadvantages, social disadvantage that digital inclusion can cause in the society? Quickly so that uh we can... Awareness and action, two simple things. First, we need to make ourselves aware of what those problems are to start acting on them at micro and macro levels, both granular and, you know, at a macro level to ensure that we're covering all of our bases. So. Excellent. So <laughs> thank you very much. Um, one hour is so short and, and yeah. we probably would have uh, elongated the webinar um, to, to have all these good ideas coming through, but uh, we've come to the top of the hour. So I would like on behalf of the Global Alliance to sincerely thank our um, uh, presenters, Dr. Wan, Nobin and Rodin, and uh, Shreyan Krishnan for those very insightful uh, presentations and thoughts. We've really benefited a lot.
I would also like to thank all the participants who joined online. This is the beginning of the diversity, equality, and inclusion webinars we're going to have. Two others. Please go to the website, www.globalizepr.org, and register for the subsequent webinars. That will come to you free as part of the benefits that Global Alliance is offering. And I would like to thank the leadership of uh, Global Alliance for creating this opportunity for us, and also to acknowledge the Global Alliance member who is leading this activity, Irene Chipili from Zambia. Thank you very much. And from all of us who have participated, thank you. We look forward to seeing you in the next webinar in the course of the month. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.